We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that we really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Steve Penny, or the Silver Chartist. How are you today, Steve? I'm doing great, Tom. Thanks for inviting me back on again. Great to have you back, as always. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you again. Uh, we have a lot of charts here to cover today. Um, and you provided a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, valuable and um, a lot of information for our, our audience the last time we spoke. So uh, why don't we dig into it here, starting with the uh, U.S. dollar. Um, you kind of have highlighted here on the chart two, you know, bull patterns and what could we see, um, you know, as a maybe as a repetition of, of these patterns here. Yeah, exactly. And the first thing that stands out to me on this chart is the series of high, lower highs and lower lows dating back to March of 2020. We also see price trading below a declining 200-day moving average, which most technical analysts would uh, right there define that as a downtrend. That's the simplest definition of a downtrend, in my opinion. It's price trading below a declining 200-day moving average. And then those two bull patterns really jump out at me. And it's interesting, the first one there on the left back from August through September of 2020. That was the last time you and I spoke on your uh, show. And you know, every, everyone was talking about that the dollar's potentially gonna rally here, it was oversold. And what's striking right now is the pattern that, that is currently developing is almost identical. Um, you can see right there the symmetry. And that was a failed breakout last time. We'll see if that rings true this time. But um, you know, I think the fundamentals and the technicals are both bearish for the dollar going forward over the inter, inter, intermediate to long term. And in the short term, I mean, there's always the possibility of a bounce up towards that 200 day moving average. Mm -hmm. And tell us a bit more about the the indicator that you have right at the top there, Steve. Sure, that's the relative strength index and RSI. And that's just a simple way to measure if a stock or a commodity is overbought or oversold. You might see the red line on the top and the green line in the bottom. And that top red line represents 70 on the RSI. The green line represents 30. And then anytime price gets below or that line gets below the green line, that's considered oversold. And uh, above the red line, it's considered overbought or technically stretched. Mm -hmm. So the last time it kind of uh, hit that hit that red line, it basically bounced and started another trend down. So that's kind of another indicator that could show us the last time it touched 70, it, it started to head back down, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's another point right there it, it, that sh shows exactly how these two patterns look identical. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So obviously, you are the silver chartist. So let's move on to talking about silver. Uh, all the excitement that happened last week, you know, it every with everything that did happen, it only ended up closing the week, you know, uh, 10 cents up from where it started the week. So uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Sure, absolutely. And I like to say the fundamentals tell me what to invest in, but the technicals tell me, you know, when to invest and can help identify precision entries and exits. And when you look at this silver chart here, um, we can see on the screen, there's this primary green uptrend line dating back to the March lows. And we've had three successful taps of that green uptrend line. And um, let's see, on January 19th was the last time we tapped that line. And uh, we since rallied above the 50 day moving average. So I like to think in terms of trends, you know, are we an uptrend or a downtrend? And whenever price is above a rising 50 and 200 day moving average, that's again, a simple definition of an uptrend. And silver's price is currently bullishly postured of bo above both of those key moving averages. However, we are below the major resistance levels of 2992. And then you could also add last week's high, that little spike high of $30.35. Once those resistance levels are cleared, I think we'll really be off to the races in silver. So Steve, do you by chance have any, any um, you know, let's say next resistance levels above that 30, 35 level? Uh, I do. Um, and we could zoom out to a weekly chart, but just to keep it simple, there's a lot of congestion in there between 30 and say 35. There's a lot mm -hmm. of price action dating back to 2011, 2012, when we had the big sell-off. Um, so th there's there's some congestion in there. Um, but, you know, I don't think there's any clear lines like that you can just pinpoint an exact level. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So 
Uh, going through in doing research for for today's interview, you talk a lot about making a trading plan for the week mm -hmm. that consists of a series of if or if then statements. So tell us more about that and and how it applied to your your trading last week. Exactly. So my strategy is a little bit unique. I'm primarily a long term investor, but I also do short term trade a portion of my portfolio, roughly five to ten percent of my mining stock portfolio. I I trade, and it's it's with anything, whether you're investing or trading, it's so important to have a plan and especially an exit plan. You know, what I, I like to say, whenever you push the buy button, have a subsequent subsequent plan to push the sell button when you're going to push it. Um, so what I like to do each and every weekend is come up with my trading plan. And that's a series of if then statements. If this happens, then I will do this. If this mm -hmm. happens, then I will do that. And it kind of takes the emotion out of having to make, you know, tough decisions in the moment when emotions are running high and, um, when, when things can be really volatile. So it kind of t takes the emotion out and it helps me personally to be a much more successful trader and investor. Excellent. So how did this apply to your chemical trading last week? Let's sure, take that right. chart, for example. Sure. So looking at the chart for Cameco, back in December, we had a major breakout above a clear resistance line. And that was the $12.30 12, uh, level. We broke out above that on uh, higher, higher than normal volume that shows big money institutional investors piling into the, piling into the sector and into this stock in particular. And whenever you come back and back test a major breakout level, that's typically a very good re-entry point. Of course, nothing works 100% of the time, but whenever something like that happens, it catches my eye. And it also catches the eye of a lot of the institutional trading algorithms that really drive these markets. So a lot of people are seeing that whenever you come and back test a major breakout level. So we saw that earlier in uh, January and that line, that 1230 support was also reinforced by a rising 50 day moving average, which you can see by that blue upsloping line there. So that's a confluence of support. So um, in our trading plan for the week, it was if price bounces from that support, we call that a trigger price, we would go ahead and buy a certain amount of shares. So that's my if then statement for that trade. And uh, of course, we issued that alert to our members. And um, we saw a nice profit on that. And sure enough, on Monday, that following Monday, price popped like 20% in a, in a single day. Interesting. So when you when you make that statement, is there is there any way, uh, let's say before you see the price action for that week, do you, do you decide ahead of time what constitutes a sell um, when you make that statement at the beginning as well? Sure. And to clarify, so we're talking about shorter term trading here. Mm -hmm. And I, trading can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. For me, I shoot for roughly 5 to 30% in 5 to 30 days. That's a good goal. Don't always hit that, but that's a good goal when I talk about trading. So that's my time frame. Um, so with those, you know, r risk management is the most important thing with trading and preservation of capital. So, you know, yeah. You have to use stop losses when trading. So I like to use stop losses of roughly five to six percent, maybe seven percent. And as long as your average winner is at least two times your average loser, you can be wrong over half the time and still be a profitable trader. So yeah, absolutely. Um, if you get into a stock, you always have to plan, have a plan on when you're going to sell to the upside or to the downside if it goes against you. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So one of your favorite spots to enter a position is if the chart is hitting a rising 200 day moving average. So tell us more about this and why this is such a great buy signal for you. It sure is. Um, so from my perspective, the 200 day moving average is the most important line that anyone can put on a chart. And that is simply because it is the most used input in the institutional trading algorithms that really drive these markets. Everyone and their brother is watching the 200 day moving average. And Statistically, when you get a pullback to a rising 200 day moving average, that's just typically a great place to accumulate for the long term. And it, it can also present some compelling trading setups as well. And we saw a lot of back tests of that level over the last few weeks. And um, we've had some nice trades off of it as well. So as we're looking at the SILJ chart, um, you can see that it that it hit that 200 day moving average. So would that go into your into your trading plan for the week of, of saying that's a, a buy for you at that point? Exactly. The, it tapped that line on 27 January, the 27th of January. So uh, I think that was a Monday, if I recall correctly. So over the weekend, we're saying, hey, if price falls back to that 200 day moving average, and then subsequently turn, uh, tries to bounce off of that level, um, you know, that's when we would go ahead and initiate a position. And sure enough, that's what happened. You can see on the chart there, there's a little wick hanging below the 200 day moving average. And then as soon as it started to come back above the 200 day, that's when we entered that position. 
And that was around, what, $13.60 or so. And over the next few sessions, we rallied all the way up to like $17.63, which is a nice nice gain in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. So at, at, at any point, are you trying to initiate a sell at that upper upper level there? Uh, again, yeah. So I, I trade a very small percentage of the portfolio. And I try not to emphasize that because honestly, trading, most people would be best served by executing a simple buy and hold strategy. It's mm -hmm. really hard to outperform a buy and hold strategy in a bull market. Um, but that said, I like to trade a small percentage for cash flow. So whenever I trade, I place a trailing stop loss. So in this case, we had a trailing stop of um, roughly five or 6%. So that trailing stop follows you up. And then once price rolls over, it sells automatically. You can be off at work or doing other things and uh, locks in a nice gain for you. So that, that's what happened on this trade. Excellent. So exactly how you're saying about, about being a, a long-term trader, let's mm -hmm. talk a little bit about the structural supply problem in the silver industry. Um, it's something that Jeff Clark brought up, um, one of the contributors to your newsletter. So why will that contribute to much higher prices in the metals, but especially the, the junior miners? Absolutely. Yeah. Jeff is uh, someone I've been looking up to for a long time. I'm just humbled to have him uh, be a contributor in the newsletter. And he, he did a piece about the uh, mine supply from primary silver miners, and it dropped almost 13% in 2020 based on the data that he had. And that's a trend that we expect to accelerate. And what's interesting, the silver market is just minuscule compared to some of the other markets out there, um, especially commodities. Roughly, It's roughly a 1 billion ounce per year market globally. And that includes recycling, mine supply. And we're sitting at what, $27 silver thereabouts. So that's $27 billion globally. So that is a infinitesimal uh, market compared to some of the other commodities and stocks out there. And as soon as investors start trying to gain access to the physical metal, I mean, there's just not enough for everyone to have it. And the only way that can resolve itself is through higher prices. And we're more bullish on silver than just about anything, um, even more so than gold. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes you the silver chartist, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we we saw the the gold to silver ratio hit an, a new all time high this this uh, past March here. So mm -hmm. um, looking at this at this gold to silver ratio chart, sh what kind of targets do you kind of take from that uh, long term targets that you take from that, and and how does that inform uh, again your your kind of long term um, investment thesis on silver? Yeah, I think the gold to silver ratio is something every precious metals investor should at least look at from time to time because this simple, one simple chart can really amplify your gains in a bull market. So for example, back in March, when we, we saw this ratio get to like 120 to one, gold was priced 120 times the price of silver. I don't think that has ever happened in all of history. Um, there's no record of that kind of ratio being at that extreme. Mm -hmm. So that presented such a compelling opportunity. I, personally, I mean, I was selling my gold to buy silver, selling gold miners to buy silver miners. And um, so silver miners and silver continue to be the most undervalued components of the precious metals complex, but it's just not as extreme as it was back in March of 2020. So mm -hmm. the ratio right now sits at about 66 to one. <clears throat> and historically, bull markets peak at around 15 or 16 to one. And I fully expect us to see that ratio uh, during this bull market, probably even lower. But that doesn't mean... I'm going to hold all silver and hardly any gold until then. Mm -hmm. So for me personally, like once we get below about 50 to one, I'm going to start scaling out of gold related or excuse me, silver related investments and just gradually start swapping that over for gold related investments, gold mining mm -hmm. stocks and such. So do you kind of take the same approach when you think about um, trading some of your physical, let's say uh, portfolio in from silver into gold? Oh yeah, levels? absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. hundred percent. I've got a whole written out long-term exit strategy. And, you know, for me personally, I'm going to begin swapping silver for gold once that ratio gets below about 50 to one and do that gradually over time. Excellent. So would you, would there be at any point on that uh, in your thinking on that, where you hold basically zero silver, uh, like let's say physical silver anymore? No, my, my plan would be once we get below about a 20 to one ratio to be roughly 90% gold, 10% silver. I, I think there's an outside possibility the ratio could go to one to one. That may sound ridiculous, but I think it's possible because, you know, it's just like a law of nature. Whenever things uh, distort from the mean for long periods of time, they tend to not only return to the mean, but overshoot in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. 
And if you look at like uh, global mine supply, for example, uh, I think I've heard Keith Newmeyer talk about it's roughly nine to one globally mi- mine supply. So, mm-hmm. you know, silver is only pulled out of the earth's crust about nine times the ratio of gold. So that's a logical ratio right there, nine to one. Um, so I'm going to hold some silver in case we see these kind of ridiculous uh, gold silver ratios, like potentially a one to one, but I'll be mostly gold once we get below a 20 to one ratio. Mm-hmm. So as, as we're talking about, you know, silver being the, let's say the silver value versus gold, let's talk a little bit about SILJ versus GDXJ um, and, and talk about how the silver miners are still undervalued versus gold miners, but to a lesser extent than the last time we spoke uh, in April or, or uh, sorry, August or September there. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, at the time, up until very recently, I mean, it was just wildly, it was at an extreme, the undervaluation of junior silver miners relative to everything else. And they still are the most undervalued component of the precious metals complex to include physical silver, physical gold, junior gold miners, senior gold miners, and senior silver miners. Junior silver miners still present the most compelling value proposition, but it's just not as extreme as it was. And the trend is moving quickly. So, you know, I like to think a couple steps ahead. And with my mining stock portfolio, I'm starting to look at more gold mining stocks as opposed to only junior silver miners. Mm -hmm. So do you think that this, this, uh, let's say, disparity exists because of the, let's say, manipulation or or really undervalued nature of silver at this point and, and the potential that these silver mining stocks really present? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think like the junior silver mining sector was just so beaten down I, for all those years going back to from 2011. I think investors and were just tired of it. They didn't want anything to do with silver miners. And the companies were poorly run back then too. You know, they, um, they, they didn't treat their shareholders properly. They uh, had excessive leverage. So I think they're starting to turn around here and institutions and bigger money investors are now more open to silver miners. And I think that's why they're starting to outperform. Mm-hmm. So Steve, do you think that this is also kind of a symptom of, of, or, or let's say that where where these silver miners are heading is also a symptom of the fact that once, let's say, the outside possibility that this um, manipulation or um, you know this long term downward price trend or or leverage for silver actually breaks, what where could we see this this ratio really get to um, if if silver were fairly valued and let's say some of these industrials came into the market and, and tried to front run this supply deficit. Mm-hmm. And uh, are you referring to the SILJ versus GDXJ ratio? Yes. Yeah. Th- I mean, there's potential for this ratio. I, 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 I don't have any models to project, you know, an mm-hmm. exact number, but I can, I, I continue to expect junior silver miners to just wildly outperform over the long term, mm-hmm. And especially as the, like I, I look at silver manipulation as I believe silver is the most manipulated market on the planet, um, hands down. And I believe that manipulation is going to fail. All manipulations do, especially with a physical commodity. Um, you know, it's not like shares of a stock that you can continue to issue. You know, if people want the physical stuff, that manipulation is going to end as they always do historically. And when that happens, I mean, these junior silver miners are just going to explode. And I just look at that as like a, just an upside kicker to the normal fundamentals, that uh, just the basic fundamentals that apply to the silver market. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we've we've seen a lot of those a lot of those charts recently about about how um, you know undervalued and and how big this short position is, and uh, it's just going to take time, obviously, to play out. So let's take uh, let's take one silver miner for example that you have here the uh, the first majestic chart, um, and and just show us kind of how this this simple technical analysis works beautifully on this chart here. Yeah, it sure does. And w- one more quick comment on the uh, manipulation. <clears throat> a-, a few years ago, I guess it was a handful of years ago now, back in, I think it was 2013, I had the opportunity to meet with uh, Jim Sinclair and uh, uh, Bill Holter was there. And uh, one thing that just really struck out to me when I spoke to Jim Sinclair, and for, for those in- listeners who may not know him, he's the, they call him Mr. Gold. He nailed uh, the gold market to the top in 1980, like to the day. Um, he's been around these markets forever. And he, he told me when the manipulation ends, the, the, the banks are going to be on the right side of it. And I don't like to hear that. That's, <laughs> I'd love to see them uh, you know, lose, but I think they're going to benefit when the manipulation ends. And it will, there will come a time where it is to their benefit. 
And you know, the idea is follow the money, right? Follow the smart money. Well, what is JP Morgan doing now? They're accumulating physical silver hand over fist. You know, what do they know? I don't know, but you know, it's just right there, following the money is, is a smart principle. That, um, that, that's a great point, Steve. And in my conversation last week with, with Ted Butler, he, he brought that point up and, and also the last time I spoke to him and it just really makes you think about exactly what you're saying. You, you have to follow the money, figure out why, you know, one of the, one of the greatest uh, shorters in this market for many, many years has closed their short position and is mm-hmm. stacking, stacking and has stacked uh, over a billion ounces of physical. Yeah, they, they may be evil, but they're not stupid. That's for sure. <laughs> That's a great point. So tell us more about the uh, the first Majestic chart here, Steve. Yeah, so this first Majestic chart is uh, similar to, we talked about Cameco before. Whenever you get a breakout of, above a major resistance level, it is really uh, a compelling entry point if you come back and back test that level. So the big resistance was $14.57. We got a breakout above that on massive volume. You might call that a breakaway gap. And uh, we went from, what, fourteen fifty seven up to $24 in uh, just a couple of trading sessions. And of course, that was partially due to the silver squeeze and the hype in social media. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, we've since last week came back, almost got to that fourteen fifty seven level. And that's now going to be key support uh, for First Majestic. And, and interestingly, if, again, to... I think one of the advantages of of technical analysis like this is that it can remove the 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 emotion mm-hmm. and and that's something that you talk about that's very important is to to remove that emotion from the day to day volatility and if you would have put this this chart on a on a weekly candle instead a lot of that noise would be removed and and you wouldn't even notice it right exactly yeah that's so so true as a technical analyst uh, I like to look at charts in multiple time frames to paint a more accurate picture Mm-hmm. Well, speaking about a, a, a longer term time frame, uh, we have Gold's ten year chart here, and you were you were speaking recently about about this being a, a real critical juncture. So, last week, obviously, we saw it move down below the eighteen hundred dollar level, and we've seen uh, this week here. We're speaking on on Monday, the eighth of February, on on the afternoon here, and we're back above eighteen thirty five. So, tell us a bit more about about where you see uh, gold's price action for the last week and and what it all means here for your sure. long-term view. Absolutely, yeah. So looking at this long-term chart, I mean, this is bullish no matter how you look at it. Um, it looks like we're forming a nice cup and handle. Even if we were, which I do not expect, but even if we pulled back another $100 or so, this would still be a bullish chart. Mm-hmm. That would just be merely the formation of a handle on the other side of this massive cup. Um, I, like I said, I don't, I don't think that's gonna happen. But zeroing in on like the two key levels to watch, um, back on November 30th of 2020, the low was 1767 in gold. We, we really don't want to see that level breached. If we fall below 1767 and close there on a weekly basis, that could signal some more short-term weakness. Again, I don't anticipate that. I, I, if I, I, I do think that's level is going to hold. But the, the other level to watch, we talked about the 200-day moving average. That's, um, we need to get back above there. We're currently a few bucks below the 200 day and that's mm-hmm. currently sitting at 1854. So th- those are the two really short-term levels I'm looking at. But when you zoom out and look at this uh, long-term chart, you could even uh, paint a bull, bull flag pattern there. And a bull flag pattern happens when you get like a really sharp rise. That's the, they call that the flagpole. And then you get a downtrending consolidation pattern. And the way to play that is once you get a breakout above the upper boundary of that flag pattern, you typically see a fairly quick run towards the top of the flag pole, which in this case would be $2,089. And then once we get above that, I think um, we'll really be off to the races in gold. Interesting. Is is there, um, you know, just, just for memory, obviously it's not on this chart, but sure. do you have kind of an upper, let's say upper bound on that next run of, of where we could see that stretch to? Uh, I, I don't, but what's really nice about, so uh, it's a common misconception that when you break out to new all-time highs, a lot of newer investors and retail investors think that's bearish. Mm-hmm. Like, um, you know, we have to come back. That's actually quite bullish as there's now no overhead resistance. So above 2089, there's really very little, there's, there is no technical resistance. There's none. So mm-hmm. what I personally use is just like historical ratios, past precedent um, to measure projected moves. And, you know, I, I'll just say my target for 2026 is around $15,000 gold. And that may sound sensational, but that should, all that is is merely an average of the last two bull markets. 
Mm -hmm. So could you use, could you still be using, if you get above 2089, could you still be using uh, indicators like an RSI? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. So uh, moving on to talking about something that is a little bit less less well known, um, why are you so bullish um, on platinum and and maybe even more bullish than than gold? And is your thinking on this informed by you know the the platinum to gold ratio? Yeah, if I could pick one reason why I'm bullish on platinum, it would be looking at the platinum to gold ratio, and you can also do. Um, you know, a, a ratio of anything against platinum, no matter how you slice it, platinum is just historically undervalued. It's wildly undervalued. And I think a lot of the reasons for that are have got to do with like the EV revolution and the demand for palladium. But I think this, ex, this ratio has just gotten so extreme and it's so far out of whack. I don't mm-hmm. think we've ever seen a platinum to gold ratio this low. Uh, someone w- recently told me that we did earlier in the 1900s. But even if that's the case, this isn't something you see very often. And we're talking about mean reversion. You know, it's very likely that we're going to revert to the mean and probably overshoot. And I think platinum is likely to outperform even gold. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about, let's say, playing the the platinum market and and really trying to capitalize on this, you know, extreme undervalued scenario for platinum? For me personally, I just keep it very simple. My sweet spots are silver, uranium, and gold. That's mm-hmm. like our main main focus. I say I'm laser focused on those three markets. But platinum has really caught my attention. So I just want to keep it simple. So I just accumulate a little bit of physical platinum. And then there's a PPLT. That's an ETF for platinum. I don't own any of that, but that's something I look at. And then some of the larger cap stocks. I'm not necessarily looking to go build a whole platinum portfolio and, and track it and everything. But you certainly could do that. Interesting. Perfect. So... Uh, Steve, you and I were talking about the um, real supply deficit um, kind of facing silver here coming into the next years. And obviously, we've seen, um, you know, exploration money really dry up in this space. And there that matches also the chart of, of the fact that there's less silver being pulled out of the ground. Something else that exactly like you were saying, being laser focused on uranium, for example, a lot of our listeners will know and understand that the long-term supply deficit uh, looming in uranium is, is just as big, if not bigger than this, than this, you know, same mechanism in the silver market. So what are some of the charts that you find most compelling at this time for uranium? Sure. I, I track um, a handful of uranium miners and the charts look very similar in that They've all had major breakout levels, um, which happened back in November. They came back near their 200-day moving average. Most of them bounced right off of it. Mm-hmm. And then we've had high volume run-ups, consolidated, and it looks like we're just starting the next push higher in uranium. And what I really like about uranium is it's just a pure supply demand play. And th- to incentivize new supply, the price is gonna have to rise. And uranium is an essential commodity. I mean, nuclear power's roughly 20% of the power grid in the United States, roughly 10% globally. And the current spot price is not high enough to incentivize new production to meet future demand. And the uranium industry is a growth industry. A lot of people don't know that. And the price is simply going to have to rise to incentivize that new production. And what's unique about uranium is there's so few companies for uh, to, to invest in. Last I checked, there was roughly 60 pure play uranium miners globally. That's a, and most of them have very small market caps. So mm-hmm. when big money tries to enter this market, I mean, you can see just really explosive moves and we're already starting to see that, but I, I do think we're in the early stages of. So uh, how do you think that, that uranium could capture some of that, let's say that attention or, or market share from uh, away from, you know, the, the shinier commodities as, mm-hmm. as we know? Uh, well, like, like a lot of things, once it starts to move, you know, unfortunately, the, the average retail investor doesn't get in until things start to really move. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, but, you know, I think we're still early, but when it starts to move, it's going to begin to capture attention. And we're already seeing that. Um, what was it about a month ago now, uh, maybe two months ago, we saw some mainstream articles about the uranium sector. And many people prior to that had never even heard about uranium. Like they didn't even know what it was. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think we're starting to get a little bit more attention given to the uranium sector. Absolutely. And it's, it's, uh, you were drawing some interesting conclusions, uh, when we were speaking before the call here about the uranium market and the, and the silver market, you know, both really sitting around $30 right now. Mm-hmm. And what are, what are their next real upper targets here? Yeah, there, there's so many similarities between the uranium market and silver market. 
And I always encourage silver investors to take a look at the uranium market. And for uranium investors, hey, take a look at the silver market. Mm -hmm. If you like one, you're probably going to like the other one as well. <laughs> and uh, what's interesting, yeah, the, the spot price of both is right around $30. You know, we're at 27 and change for silver, uh, just over 29 for uranium. And what's interesting, the, the intermediate term target for both metals, and uranium is a metal, by the way, um, is about $50. Mm -hmm. And $50 was the previous all-time high in silver. And right about $50 is the price that's needed to incentivize that new production for uranium. So both of those have about a $50 price target. And both markets are so small, like, like we were just saying. So you know, just a rise from $30 uranium up to 50 could see really big moves in the uranium mining stocks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, you know having having a little bit of cross pollination and and mm -hmm. ideas swap back and forth from from each different sector would be uh, would be beneficial. Uh, Steve, do you have any um, other you know concluding thoughts as we wrap up here? Well, just w one more thing to add on to what you just said. It's it's been really nice because you know silver investors know that the pullbacks are brutal and it can be a little bit demoralizing. Mm -hmm. And it's really nice. Sometimes it doesn't always work out this way, but you know, uranium might be rallying while the silver market's pulling back. So, you know, it, it makes you feel good. It's, it kind of balances your psych, psych uh, your emotional state a little bit, at least part of your portfolio is going up and they kind of ebb and flow and can move uh, in opposite, um, you know, directions of each other, which is nice too. Absolutely. Uh, I encourage all of our listeners to go and, and check out your, your free newsletter. It's, it's a, you know, a great wealth of knowledge. They can check that out over on uh, silverchartist.com. Um, some of our, our favorite uh, guests on the show um, are also contributors like Patrick Karim from Bad Charts, Kevin Wadsworth uh, or North Star and, and Jeff Clark are also, they're all uh, contributors to your newsletter. Um, anywhere else that you'd like to have people find you, Steve? Sure. I, I post a lot of free things on Twitter. Um, and one thing I found with Twitter, you know, they limit your characters and I always want to say more. So that's why we launched the free free letter. It goes out every week. And we the goal is just to provide a ton of value for free. There, there is a premium option, but there's never any, uh, you know, pressure to upgrade to that or anything. Um, the goal is just to provide a ton of va value for free in that uh, free weekly letter. And silvercharts.com is where you can find that. Excellent, Steve. Uh, thanks very much for your time today. Appreciate it. Th thank you so much, Tom. Appreciate it. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please